Welcome to MapleWoodEden.com podcast. We have on the phone James Campion. How are you doing, James? I'm well. How are you, sir? Good. You, of course, are the author of Shout It Out Loud, the story of Kiss's Destroyer and the Making of an American Icon. That's, uh, that's quite a title, and you will be at Words Bookstore in Maplewood Village uh, this Saturday, February 13th at 7.30 p.m. Now, those of us uh, who know KISS may not know the whole story, correct? What, uh, what does your book uh, portend to tell about, for, for KISS fans and non-KISS fans? Well, the main theme of my book really was that period from mid-1975 through late 1976 when the Destroyer album was being thought about and written and recorded. So I have a full history of that. But the main theme also, uh, you know, sort of a sidelight, uh, an undercurrent, if you will, is really just the idea of KISS at that period and how they connected with the zeitgeist. That 1970s uh, experimental period, the -the over-the-top aspect of it, the David Bowies and the New York Dolls, the Iggy Pops, the Kisses on the other side of the coin, certainly uh, the Parliaments or the Elton Johns in the pop world. Uh, it's just a different world, and Kiss fit into that. And Destroyer, really, I call it in my book, it's the Kiss Manifesto. Uh, it's everything that they were talking about in their ethos, what they built the band around with the kabuki makeup and the shows and the theatrics. Um, what they did for the first time with Destroyers, they put that all into an image, and that image helped to sell it as a mass product. And it really created that, and due to the beautiful, uh, iconic painting by Ken Kelly, the famous car- uh, comic artist mm. that painted that famous picture of them leaping off the mountain, it did create them as American icons to the point where today uh, their music is still used to sell cars, uh, to, to be in co- cartoons with Scooby-Doo, and uh, their faces are very iconic. So I think this is the period I'm trying to say where they could have become sort of a one-hit wonder, kind of an, uh, a weird oddity of the 70s, or something that would last 40-plus years, which it has. Now, now Kiss, for, for those of us know sort of their fame comes from songs like uh, Rock and Roll All Night, Party All Day, and... Uh and um, and the makeup and sort of the wild. Where does this fit in? Did this? I think you and I talked earlier. This sort of launched them into a, the higher level, or was this after that first no, rise to power? Event. They were at a crossroads. Right. They were at a crossroads here. They 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 were a bankrupt uh, uh, a commodity, really. Their no. management had had drawn as as far as they could in debt to keep them on the road with all these th- theatrics. They weren't selling records, so their record company was sort of floundering. They had just started up Casablanca Records, and then they put out uh, they they recorded a live album called The Live uh, in uh, the spring and summer of 1975, but it hadn't come out yet when they were started to work on Destroyer. So when they started to work on this album, they, were, they had not sold any albums before. So they, they started with the great producer, Bob Ezrin, who had sold millions and millions of records and made Alice Cooper a number one sensation internationally. And, and Bob really brought them you know, back, like I said, to using the songs and the imagery to sell them, whereas before they just wrote songs about girls or running mm-hmm. around the streets or partying, like you said, and he gave them sort of a, gave a pathos, if you will, to their ethos. So um, there's that, and like I said, they were at this crossroads, and it's all in the book. It's mm-hmm. amazing how you could work so hard and do everything right to a certain extent and then come up to a point where just the slightest little thing can go wrong or right for you, and luckily for Kiss, it went right, but that's all in the book. It's, it, it really is a drama. It's a great drama in pop culture. Now, this was their, if I'm reading my list here, their fourth album, that came out in uh, 1976. Yes. But it, they had three albums prior that uh, did pretty well, that went gold, if I'm reading this right. Oh, no, not at all. In no? Fact, okay, you tell me. Yeah, the first three records only sold about 75,000 copies. Ah, uh, and they charted, uh, well, maybe that's since then they've sold. Yes. That's what it is. But at the time, they, they did not chart well, and then what, you know, what? well, first of all, what's sort of the history of Kiss, quickly, for those who might not know, um, were, were they all friends long ago, or did they, how did they sort of come together? Uh, well, it was very fabricated. Paul Stanley and Gene Simmons uh, were in a band called Wicked Lester, and they were trying to get their feet wet, and they were looking for ways to do it. And the New York Dolls, which came out of the Mercer Center, Mercer Center movement, which predated the CBGB's movement later ah. on, 
Uh, that that Kiss kind of was on the outskirts of that, um, and, and they wanted to get in. And the way they could do it, they felt, was to was to 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 tap into the whole makeup and the glitter glam bit. Uh, they ended up picking Peter Chris out of another man called Chelsea. Uh, he had been uh, he was in his late twenties. They were in their early twenties, so he had been around the circuit for quite a bit. They actually put an ad in Rolling Stone magazine. They were looking for someone thin who had the right look. So they were going for a look right off the bat. And then Ace Freely, their guitar player, joined later and they were looking for someone flashy, and he gave them that flash of the lead guitar. Then they formulated this band, and unlike other bands you read about in rock music, whether it be U2 or uh, R.E.M. or even the Rolling Stones who had to come up through the clubs and play cover material and, and build a following among the youth, Kiss didn't have that. They came blasting right away. They portray what I call in the book The Act, capital T, capital A, where they acted like rock stars, like, you you need to get on board with this. We don't need to cut, get you to like, you, you need need to see this. And they were they attracted their manager Bill Coin, who had worked in television and had an advertising agency behind him, so he knew when he saw dollar signs and how to develop that, which he did. And then they signed with Casablanca Records, which was run by Neil Bogart, who was at that time considered the bubblegum king. He would mm. go on to be the disco king. He would start. Uh, he would make millions of dollars off of the likes of the Village People and Donna Summers. So these guys all had the right. They was very, very structured and fabricated. This is not a grassroots thing. Although their live work on the road when they had to open up for other bands that didn't want some band spitting blood and blowing things up. Mm. It, they were upstaging a lot of the bands, so they really did have to work in that way, grassroots. But the way, their origins comes very much, very meticulous, very planned out. Now, it was, you said Gene and Paul were, brought it together. They started it. Where are they both from? What's their background? Uh, all four guys are from New York. Uh, okay. Gene and Paul are from Queens. Gene was originally an Israeli. He, was, he grew up on the western coast of Israel. Oh, wow came here, his mother was a Holocaust survivor and a single mother who had to bring him here. Um, uh, Paul Stanley is the son of uh, an educator, and uh, I think his father was a mechanic. Um, but very, very erudite. Oh, both those guys were educated very well. Uh, on the other side of the coin, interestingly enough, and you'll see the divisions when you read my book among the personalities. It's fascinating. Peter, Peter Chris, who was Peter Chris Cola, uh. the Brooklyn area, very, very tough Italian neighborhood, a lot of gangs, a lot of fighting. And Ace Freely was Paul Freely, and he grew up in the Bronx, not too far where I grew up, near where my dad grew up in the Grand Concourse. So they're all New York boys. Now, they also came out, they, as you said, sort of the glam, early glam rock, real showman, flashy. But if, if the timing, as I'm seeing this, is right, they came out uh, around the same time the Ramones started, which were a different era, which was more of a punk. Although the Ramones, I think, are almost unfairly categorized as just punk, when they really have some good... Is there any... Anything to say about that era when sort of the early punk began, the early glam, and obviously Bowie had been around. You mentioned him, the New York Dolls. Yeah, this is, is all New York, too, New, uh, the Kiss and, and the Ramones, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I, I touch upon that. I do a chapter on that in the book. Uh, New York City during the 1970s is the epicenter of what the future of music was. It really was. I mean, there was a lot of different things coming out of there. And in the early 70s, Kiss was kind of in a weird spot. They came in at the butt end of the glam movement. The glam movement had already been through England. It had been you know, re, redone right. with, by Mark Bolin and, and Gary Glitter and a lot of these bands. That, so they, they kind of came in at the end of that. Uh, and they were predated the punk movement, which would have been 1976 when it started to build right. out of the uh, Bowery, uh, but the likes of Television and the Dead and the uh, and the, uh, the the Ramones and the um, and later on Blondie and Talking Heads. Uh, so they they sort of they were like in the middle of those two things. Now, but did they did they when when Gene and Paul got together? Did they want to do the whole visual makeup uh, you know craziness issue, or did that come later as a way to promote them? They they. they wanted to do that. That was their idea. Yeah, and Paul Stanley says, I wanted to be the band I wanted to see. Gene Simmons says, I didn't, there was too much people standing around with beards and long hair looking like they just got off of, uh, you know, of a gas station job looking at their shoes playing. Uh, we weren't interested in that. We wanted to put a show together that we wanted to see. We wanted to, to, to run around the stage and be characters and emote those characters so we can play in front of five people or 5,000 people or 50,000 people and they'd get it. So right from the very beginning, this thing was built to be huge. And I make the argument in my book that Destroyer is the point where they go from wanting to do that to actually achieving it. Do you think uh, uh, that a lot of this, they didn't get credit? Did, first of all, did they write their own music and songs? or They did. What, they, so they were self-made. They were original music. Did, did the sort of act and the makeup kind of 
uh, give lower their credibility as a real rock band, even though the music was still very good, or was it one was was went along with the other? Well, that's an excellent question. Excellent. Um, it, it haunted them, and it haunts them to this day. Yeah. Uh, the, the, you know, I've, I've done very well with this book. It's been very well, if I may say, and thanks to Backbeat Books, my publisher. No, that's great. It, 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 they did a really great job promoting it, and, and, and there are so many Kiss fans out there. And I got you know we have a Facebook page for it, the Shout It Out Loud Facebook page, and thousands, and thousands, and thousands of emails and texts and things through Facebook. The one thing that comes up every time is Kiss fans feel, and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to write what I jokingly call an intellectual treatise mm. on a pop act. Is I, there was never any book that kind of celebrated the subtext of Kiss. Um, you know, I, I, I dabble in different things. I talked about postmodernism in my book. I talk about, uh, you know, tapping into the zeitgeist. I talk about utilizing uh, the minstrel show uh, kind of concept in the KISS uh, aura. But it, the, to answer your question, the, the KISS was haunted by the fact that they had all these theatrics. People never took them seriously. What the great Bob Ezrin, and half my book is about Bob, and if you don't know about him, please Google him, because Bob's one of the great geniuses of rock music. Excellent. Um, he was able to see what he saw with Alice Cooper, which was there's something to this. You can tap into the theatricality of it and actually use it as a selling point. So for the first time on Destroyer, Kiss just, just didn't have songs about driving with girls in the car and drinking beer and partying. These are songs about, there's songs about Greek mythology on this. There are choirs on there. there these are songs about youthful uh, rebellion. There's songs in here about, about um, how the mortality of youth and how invincibility versus the mortality. It's about dreaming. It's about longing. I mean, there's a song on there called Beth, which was their biggest hit ever, which is now a Volkswagen commercial, that, that Kiss would have never done without Bob. Bob gave them, and arguably it's probably the first power ballad in the history of rock. Yeah, that's a very, it's a very mixed album. I was listening to it earlier just to kind of re-familiarize. Right. So why don't we go to 75, which is sort of the, where the book starts. They, they've been in three, they've had three albums, they've had some acclaim, they've had some, some fame. What, what was going on uh, that, that sort of drives the, the element of your book in the time period? Where were they and where did they have to go and how did they get there? Well, when, by the time they had been playing for for two and a half years, right. with great notoriety on on the um, from like you know January '73 to the spring of 1975, for almost two years, they had been playing a little over. They've been playing to big crowds, uh, mm. opening and, and 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 playing to crowds, building up one show at a time, really working hard on the road. But they were selling no records. Plus. Mm. Their management and their record company were, were hemorrhaging money because they were paying all this money. I mean, other acts. Like Alice Cooper, who I interviewed for the book, told me that we actually had to look over our shoulder because even though we were the number one band in the world at that time, Kiss was spending three, or we thought, three or four or five times as much on their, on their shows because they were borrowing money. and you know, So they were really creating this illusion that they were on top of the world when they were really just struggling. And when they go to get Bob Ezrin, they're basically saying, please, please help us create something like you did with Alice Cooper to give us that push. And so they start working with Bob. And, and he became they, what? He became their manager or? Their producer. Producer, I'm okay. That out. He's the uh, producer yeah. on, dress, on uh, Destroyer. On Destroyer, yes. And when Bob joined the group, he oh. wanted to work with them the way he worked with Alice Cooper. There's a famous story in Kistory, as they say, ah. Boot Camp. And I have a whole chapter named Boot Camp in which Bob sat them down. And he started to talk about themes. And he tells this great story about how he wanted them to be like Marlon Brando's character in The Wild Ones. Uh. He said, I wanted you, you guys are all, have these 13-year-old, 15-year-old boy, pimply boys, and I was one of them, that uh. like, and you don't appeal to women. And you need to appeal to women in different types. And I always thought, and this is Bob talking, he told me in the hours of interviews that I had that are in the book with Bob, is that he said, I wanted to take that, I wanted to take that vulnerability under the tough guy with the, with the leather jacket. You know, Brando in that movie is a tough guy just like everybody else, but he's got something about him like that James Dean thing that a girl wants to take him home and cuddle him and, and, and you know, knows that he's got a heart and a soul. And Bob kind of brought that to them and gave them more depth and tried to make this record almost like uh, a drama. And it's not a concept album. You know, Bob worked on the wall with Pink Floyd, so that's his great. Ah, concept. excellent. 
and he did Welcome to My Nightmare, of course, with Alice Cooper. So he wanted to bring a little bit of that. But Bob, when he joined them, he thought he was going to be their Svengali forever. He thought he was going to work with them for years. They were so traumatized. They were so shifted. They were so cracked into shape by working on Destroyer that the, within months they ran to Eddie Kramer, who produced their demos in 1973, uh, who worked with Jimi Hendrix and others, and, and they did a series of albums with him. This was a one-off. This was a one-shot. This was a snapshot in the history of Kiss and rock music in the 70s. It was never repeated, and there was no way, if you're a Kiss fan, you could see it coming. If you listen to Destroyer and listen to any other Kiss album, I defy anyone with any kind of ear to try to marry them. It's very, very hard. It, it, it's in and of itself its own statement, and I find that fascinating. Now, what, what was different about this album that was not before or after? Well, the songwriting, first of all, Bob sat him down and said, I want different themes. So Paul Stanley came to him with a song called Detroit Rock City, which is a celebration of Detroit, which was one of the few cities in the country that embraced them. You know, Detroit was the hotbed of, sure. of, uh, of rock music. Uh, you know, Ted Nugent and Iggy, you know, Iggy Pop and uh, Alice Cooper decamp there. So you have uh, Kiss wanting to do that, but he had this undercurrent, Paul, of a, of a kid getting in his car and driving to make the midnight show, and, and he's partying and he's screaming. He's got that invincibility. It's classic America. A kid in the car speeding down the highway. <clears throat> At the end of the song, he gets in a car accident. There's, there's something that's very deep and dark and Shakespearean about it, if I may, that is in no other Kiss album. Most Kiss albums and Kiss songs are basically chants, and again, their subject matter are girls mm -hmm. or partying. And then he has songs in there, like I said, Beth, which you can't even imagine a Kiss band. Yeah, album. it's almost a love song. Right, and then, you know, you got, uh, he took the Beethoven's Pathetique, uh, which is a piano sonata, sonata number eight that he took, uh, that he created for the beginning of a song that Gene Simmons had called Great Expectations, put a choir on it. There's backwards tracks on this record. There's a calliope in one of the songs. There's seven four time. There's different harmonies. So, so Bob is a classical genius. He was classically trained, and he had worked for years with orchestras and stuff. So it was almost like taking Leonard Bernstein and bringing him in to work with, or much like what George Martin did with the Beatles. But George Martin was classically trained, and you would never get Eleanor Rigby or A Day in the Life without George Martin, and you certainly wouldn't get Beth or Great Expectations without Bob. Was this, was this Kisses uh, Sergeant Peppers in a way? Aha. Yeah, you know, that's come up a lot in interviews yeah. I've done, and I've said it, and I, and I said it in the context of this, and I'll make this point real quick. I, when you say that, it's almost sacrilege, and I understand the Beatles. Well, I'm not saying it's, it's like Sergeant Pepper. To them, it is their Sergeant Pepper, in that Sergeant Pepper was a very creative uh, outlet for the Beatles. That's, I think that's what most people would say, but go ahead, I'm sorry. Yes. No, 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 that's exactly what I meant, and I was taken yeah. wrong a couple of times, but I, I made this point in other interviews, and it's very important to note that when you look at the, the lineage of great artists and their arc, take the Beatles, for example, you have Rubber Soul, which is their breakthrough from the sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're singing more of introspective stuff. They're using acoustic guitars. They're using sitars. That leads into Revolver, which arguably is one of the greatest records ever made, even greater than Sgt. Pepper's, in the sense where it used all the aspects that they really triumphantly used in Sgt. Pepper's. And you could see the chronology of it. I used Bob Dylan as an example, too. You could see where Dylan goes electric, bringing it all back home into, into um, you know, his next record, and eventually you get to Blonde on Blonde. You could see it. With Kiss, you don't see that. This is why I bring in Bob Ezrin as a key element of all this, because Kiss had other producers. They had other people working with them. They had to rush out their albums because they were constantly on the road. So you get three records that are basic, they could be the Sweet from the 1970s or the Bay City Rollers mm -hmm. or Black Sabbath. Very basic, four chords, bar chordy stuff with chanting vocals. Um, and then, bang, you get Destroyer. And then after that, you get another record that's more like a rock record. So you don't see the evolution. It's just thrown right in there. So that where, that's where it really differs from the whole Sgt. Pepper analogy. And, of course, we're talking to James Campion, author of Shout It Out Loud. He'll be at Words Bookstore on Saturday night, 7.30 p.m. in Maplewood Village. Check out the book. Uh, one quick question. Um, where is KISS today? And do you, are, they're all still with us, correct? Uh, indeed. Uh, only two people are in the band proper now. There is a KISS uh, version uh, still performing? It does. It does about Who's in there? Who's in there? They have a KISS cruise where fans can go on. They do special events. But, yeah, they do about 75 shows. They do, they do a couple of weeks in Vegas. So it's really like an ongoing thing. Ace Frehley left the band in 1982. Uh, or, excuse me, yeah, Peter Chris left in 79, 80. 
uh, H. Lee left in 82. They all came back together for a reunion tour in 96. They ran that to the end of the century for a couple of years. Wow. Part of ways again. So it's been going on for quite some time. And I will say this, if you, if I may, I'm, I'm going to, uh, at the bookstore this Saturday, I, I really hope to get some people there for Q&As and talk about, get a vigorous discussion Absolutely. on this rock music. And I'm going to bring photographs that have never been seen before that were given to me by engineers and people behind the scenes of the making of the record. I want to talk about how records were made in the 70s, how it differs from today. And I want to play a very interesting combination of the original demo of Beth, which was called Beck, to show you the brilliance and genius of Bob Ezrin and how he used music and classical music to, confu to, to fuse that in with rock music and create a different kind of sound and an image. So I hope everybody can make it. It'll be a lot of fun. Who, have you who did you talk to from the band for this book? Uh, I did not speak to anyone directly right. from the band for this book, and I'll tell you why. I'll make it quick. Sure. I had done an interview with Paul Stanley in 2006 for a solo album, and I asked him some questions about Destroyer. I, I started this book in 2011. Oh. Uh, Gene Sims was not approachable. You could oh. not you know, unless he had his full hand and full approval. I did not want it to. Yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. That uh, seems odd, though. What's that? I'm sorry? That seems odd. I mean, he would seem like he'd want people to know about it and the stories, or I guess they get a little, a little gun-shy after so much negative press probably they've had a lot of probably critics attacking them over the years yes i mean if you yeah. know anything about gene simmons he's he's a you know he's a, he's a ceo and a, he's a rock star in a ceo's outfit i mean yeah. gene is, is has protected the brand for for many years and he he feels that if anybody's writing about kiss they're just making money off of him i was trying to write a history book i wasn't interested in, in selling and you're books. a fan he's come off like a like a very loyal fan who really just wants to get the story out there i would think uh, that's what i did i approached it as a journalist and as a historian as best i could i've been called an academic which i'm not uh because of the my approach but i was trying to give it a more lofty appeal but uh just to answer your question real quick yeah the the, the rest of it is ace freely was writing a memoir at the time so is peter chris peter lives right here in jersey now uh ace uh, I've, I've known a lot of people around Ace. I've met him before. We've talked, but he refused to talk about this album. And if you read the book, you'll know why. This was a very difficult time in Ace's life. And but I, I quote from everybody's memoirs, and I made sure all the archival materials in there. So any interviews that Kiss did around the period, I, tr I, I, I have put in this book, so people have a real sense of the source material. Uh, everybody else that had anything to do with the record I interviewed. I interviewed Ezrin. I interviewed the two engineers. I interviewed the guys who designed their tour that year. I interviewed Ken Kelly, who painted the cover. Dennis Wallach, who designed everything. Anybody who had anything to do with Destroyer in the background and people who went on to do other great things with other acts like David Bowie and the Rolling Stones uh, are all quoted in here and their stories and the behind-the-scenes stories. So I think it's a really good, if I may, snapshot of that period not just for Kiss, but rock music, and it's very nostalgic now because it's a different era with Spotify and. Oh my God! It's it's I, it's it's. I think that a lot of the music today is, is sort of weak and 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 not able to be real, uh, uh, creative and and sort of out there. And a lot of that's the record business, and and how that's changed. Uh, but what tell people? What's your background? Uh, quickly. Yeah, I'm a journalist. Um, I've been working more or less in journalism and broadcast journalism since the early 1980s. Um, I'm the contributing editor for the Aquarian Weekly. I've been working there since sure. uh, 1997. I write a column called Reality Check. We have our own um, department, the Reality Check News and Information Desk. Uh, I write entertainment reviews and uh, features for the Huffington Post. I've interviewed dozens of rock stars over the years. Um, it's really, it's, this is my sixth published book. Um, the fifth nonfiction book, two of them are compendiums. I wrote a book called Deep Tank Jersey about the uh, Jersey Shore and all the cover bands. Actually, the, the 20th anniversary of that book is this summer. They're going to have a big party for it, I think at Jenkinson's or somewhere in the, at the shore. Um, and, um, but this was, this was a labor of love for me. Like you said, I, I, I was a Kiss fan when I was a kid. I opened the book with um, me opening a record album and, and the sacred moment that was for us kids back in the 70s. Yes, I remember. I, I, I tell my kids, we recently, my kids are 15 and uh, 11, and we recently got a turntable and some old records, and my kids could even hear the difference of the of the vinyl. And I remember telling them, you know, we I grew up in Summit, which had Scotty's Record Shop, which has now gone back to be a real vintage record store, which is really great. And I took them in there, and, and I remember what you say. You, you would go, you'd get the album, you'd put it on, you'd listen to the whole thing, 
uh, and you could get a taste of everything on the album and the whole context of the cover and the liner notes and whatever inside things. And I know with Kiss, there was a lot of things that came with their albums. I know I was I loved the Who and Billy Joel and a lot of that. You still remember where you listened to that first album, and you're right, opening the the album and seeing all the pieces of it in terms of the artwork and the wrapping and packaging that you don't get now even on a CD, and certainly not downloading anything. Right, and I'll tell you, Joe, here's where, here's where the rubber, rubber hits the road for me, and, and you totally just framed it beautifully. Back, and this is something I talk about in the book and was told to me by people from the day, the listening experience, the album listening experience, specifically in the 70s and some part of the 80s, everything about it is different. You had to be tethered to a yes. room. You had to put the record on, viscerally land the needle on it. Then you had to flip the record over so it was like the first part of the second part, yes. the first chapter of the second chapter. So they, I've talked to artists. I've talked to an artist that's out now, Eric Hutchinson, just Saturday. He's got a record that's coming out. His new release is going to be on vinyl, and he made a concerted effort to do what they used to do in the old days, a great opener, a great side one closer, a good reopener, and a final, which I think Destroyer has. That's number one. Number two, you had to pay attention, like you said, you looked at the cover of the, of the, of the, the, uh, the record, or you just had to use your imagination. Once they started to make everything mobile, first with cassettes and an 8-track and putting it in cars and putting it in, in um, boom boxes and then putting it in uh, you know, the, the, the cassette players and the CD players, that the Walkmans, and now with the iPods, there's so many distractions. People do everything to music, which I think is great. Don't get me wrong. You run to it. You, you, you ride your bike. People have music on. You see these, these basketball players coming and going from games. They got the headphones. But back then, you really had to engage with the music. So lyrics meant everything. Sounds meant everything. You know, how they panned it, stereo. And, and, and we really, us audiophiles, people who are absorbed in that, we just couldn't get enough of it. So you really did frame that very well. But I have a whole section of my book that talks about not just how it was presented, because your kids are right. Albums do sound better. The, the word analog comes from analogous, which means it means it's exactly the way the men wanted or the women made you wanted to hear it in that room. But it's also how we absorbed it. It was completely different. And, of course, that means those records come at you completely differently. Right, and you'd put on a pair. Of, I remember I would put on a pair of headphones, lie down. That's I think the song "Magic Carpet Ride" by Steppenwolf. I've been told part of that comes from laying down on the carpet with the headphones, closing your eyes, and you listen to the songs. And there are certain albums, I think Sgt. Pepper among them, that are made to listen to with both sides, with headphones or with with really good stereo to hear the shift from one side to the other and the whole experience. And and now that a lot of that's gone away, but the fact that there are still vinyl options out there uh, and they're coming back a little is good. But we've been talking to James Campion, author of Shout It Out Loud, the story of Kiss's Destroyer and the making of an American icon. He will be at Words Bookstore in Maplewood Village on Saturday, 7.30 p.m. Check it out. Uh, see more at uh, wordsbookstore.com. And uh, his Twitter is at at Fear No Art, but his pictures there, James Campion, and all the information on Destroyer. Check out the uh, appearance and the book. And uh, if you've never listened to the album or you haven't listened to it for a while, you can find it uh, on YouTube and elsewhere or go buy it and let Kiss make a little money that they deserve for making it. And uh, we'll go from there. All right, Kiss. <clears throat> thank you very much. I hope to see you there, and I'm really looking forward to the appearance. You too, sir. Be well. All right, bye-bye.